So with that, uh, we just want to welcome you. My name is Jessica Matley. I'm a training coordinator for Caltrain. That's the California Training Institute, but our friends call us Caltrain. So we hope you do as well. We're funded by California's Office of Child Abuse Prevention. And our role and our mission is to provide free quality evidence-based or evidence-informed resources to stakeholders, staff, administrators of family resource centers and the like throughout the state of California. The ultimate goal is that we are providing you with support as you support families and children um, in the effort to prevent child abuse. So that's kind of how, what we're doing here. Uh, we host many different types of trainings, webinars. We have self-paced courses. We have a lot of different things that are available at no cost to you. Uh, we just hope that you use them. We always say, please don't attend for the certificate attend for the action items you're going to implement with your organization. So we're excited for that. And today is no exception. We have an incredible presenter. I wish I had one of those DJ horns. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie Comstock. Uh, yeah. And she's here to talk to us a little bit about supporting families through a best practice called standards of quality for family strengthening and support. I feel like this I could do a Debbie Comstock webinar about how great she is, but I will let her introduce herself so that I don't embarrass her because I would love to do that. Uh -huh. um, now, a couple things before, you know, we have, I have a counterpart. Her name is Dana. You can actually see her photo mm -hmm. in the panelists. Dana is my counterpart. We are both training coordinators. Um, we support all the different counties and regions of California with trainings just like this. So she is also going to be your, um, the voice of Caltrain in the chat box. So as you're seeing links drop in there, those are not by accident. Uh, these are incredible resources we want to make sure you also take advantage of. For example, in October, which is too soon. It's like We're tomorrow, the basically. Yep. <laughs> um, we have some parenting, uh, some nurturing child and parent development courses, trauma parenting and challenging behaviors for school-age children, a hope, com I mean, there's a lot going on today. So, um, oh, it looks like someone's asking about today's deck. You just missed it. We dropped a PDF in the chat box. Dana just did it. Look at that. She's so on top of it. Um, so you can click that. And if you see um, any of your friends asking that question, hopefully we see it too. And we'll drop it in there again. So last but not least, we want to um, encourage you. I know when it comes to Zoom, that phone of yours is going to light up when a text message comes through and you probably have an email alert set up on your desktop. <laughs> Fight the urge, people. You're going to build some resistance today, okay? You'll build it by fighting the temptation of looking and giving your all um, to this session because there's some incredibly valuable content here for you today. So with that, I want to pass it over to Debbie. Say thank you so much for being with us and being such a great partner. We're excited for today's training. Yes, thank you so much. And Dana and Jennifer, who we don't see, but is there. Mm -hmm. And just really want to thank Caltrend for the support they give in us being able to do these, um, this overview in particular. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it looks like as far as the standards. So I'm guessing that you're probably here today because you work with families. And we know that you do good work. That's not even in question. But did you may want to know how to take your work and put it in a framework where it can have a larger impact within your community, um, within the state of California, and even nationally. So my name is Debbie. You've heard my name a couple of times, Debbie Comstock. Um, I am a trainer with the National Family Support Network, but I mainly train within the state of California on the standards of family support practice as we roll some of those out. My roots are in San Diego, where I very first learned about the standards uh, when I was the center director of a family resource center in East County, San Diego. It was while there that I had the opportunity to participate in vetting the standards as they began to come forward and as we began to look at this as an, um, as an implementation practice. Um, I've been a social worker for about, oh, I hate to say this, 28 years. That's a while. Uh, and my work has mostly been with uh, working with prevention, particularly primary prevention of child abuse, child neglect, and domestic violence. So now we have a poll that we'd like to do. 
um, I'm going to ask Jen's going to put this poll in for you to connect with. We'd like to know where you're all joining us from. So if you wouldn't mind doing that. Almost everybody has. Yeah, I think we're done. I'm going to go ahead and um, looks like we've got a little about 80%. So I'm going to go ahead and end it and share the results. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so this is interesting. We have quite a few here from the Central Valley and Southern. Uh, we also have a number of people here outside of California. So welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, this, this overview will talk a little bit more about California than what you may have no normally heard, but it will still be very valuable information for you. So thank you all for joining us, Bay Area, Mountain Valley, and Northern Region too. That's great. That helps a lot, kind of knowing where everybody's from. So I want to talk to you just for a minute about the National Network. Um, this network was founded in 2011, and it initially started out with eight states as a membership organization. Since that time, it has grown to 34 member networks. And that covers more than 3,000 family resource centers, but I actually think that that's an underestimated number. I think it's actually more than that. And that those family resource centers, those 3,000 we're talking about, serve more than 2 million people annually. So this is a large network. Um, and we just recently had Mississippi, who rejoined the network after some restructuring in their state. And just this month, Del Delaware joined with two family resource centers. So you see, it doesn't take a huge amount of work within your state, although family resource centers are a lot of work to establish, to be a part of the National Family Network. California is, California has been since the beginning, and that's one of the reasons why we'll talk a little bit about California's role in this. So the National Family Support Network has a mission and vision. You can see that there on the screen. I don't need to read every word of it for you, but you can see that mainly it is for us to look at positive outcomes and finding those positive out outcomes by leveraging collective impacts, impacts of state networks, impact of family support and strengthening practices, and significantly by looking at policies, the policies that impact families. Uh, our vision overall is that that map you just recently saw, that every state is turned green, that we have a nation in which every family is thriving, and every state has a strong and effective network. Um, a way that this can be accomplished is by something we'll talk a lot about today, and that's the uh, standards of family support practice, because that is sort of the implementation component that the national network uses to, to do this mission and vision. Now, California, is fortunate. We, we've been on the ball since the beginning. California has a state network. That network is called the California Family Resource Association. Some of you may already be familiar with that. That network has been very instrumental in helping us to convene and connect member networks across the state, mostly so that we can communicate, talk about our effectiveness, talk about what supports we might need, we also are able to promote evaluation in our practice. And again, that includes using what we're talking about today, using the standards of family support, because it gives us a way to share a common language. It gives us a way to evaluate some of our work. And I wanna emphasize that in looking at this, we are not looking at you revamping your entire programs. We are looking at you taking your program and placing it within a framework that is supportive of families. This way too, we will raise the visibility and the value that family strengthening support networks have in our state. And that's increasingly important as we look at our policymakers and we wanna make sure that decisions are being made that support families. So the California Family Resource Association, here's their vision and mission. You see that it aligns very closely with the national, uh, national network vision and mission. We all work at this just maybe coming at it a little bit different way. Um, we call this the three C's, connect, convene, and communicate. 
within the Family Resource, California Family Resource Association. I have to say that that convene and connect or convene and communicate piece has become significantly important as we work at somewhat rebooting what we've had going for a while, but that it's time to strengthen it a little bit more. Oh gosh. Don't we tell people to mute their phones and then what do I do? Not mute. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> so um, by being a part of, oh, let me go back one. I think I bumped it. The California Family Resource Association is, has always been around, well, has been around actually since about 2006. When the, when the, uh, when it first connected, let me see, I lost my place. Can you tell? CIFRA, let's just go there. Nope, oh, hold on. Yeah, let's go there. There is a California Family Resource Association Networks Committee. Now this committee is the original California Family Support Network. That was actually founded in 2009. It was founded after we spent some time looking at the, at the standards. In 2020, that network merged with CIFRA because we knew that we had common missions and visions and it didn't make sense to be duplicating a process when we were trying very hard to strengthen networks and um, help agencies and organizations who supported California families. So again, here's the big picture of the networks committee. And you see that it aligns very closely with all the vision and missions that we've talked about already. Uh, it, it's about convening, it's about communicating, and it's about making sure that we, I like this part on here too, where we retain experts in the field. California is fortunate because it has been a strong component of developing the standards. We have many ex experts in our state, and it's been important for us to, uh, to keep these uh, experts in place so that they can continue to guide us in, in our leadership. So there it is, the three C's, connect, convene, and communicate. And that, that'll get mentioned several times in this, uh, in this webinar because of its role. And as I mentioned, the Networks Committee has had a very strong role way before the national network was even formed. The Standards Committee convened networks across the state in an 18 month development process. 17 sets of standards were scanned nationwide. So after looking at those 17 sets of standards, the one that was settled on was the one that came out of San Francisco. San Francisco's set of standards seemed to make the most sense for California. And it was able to get a lot of support behind it. Notice the support components, foundation support, the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, and significantly the Center for the Study of Social Policy, who did an overview of the standards and matched them to some things that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes for being able to look at evidence informed. Then, as I mentioned, they were vetted and adopted and approved by the Networks Committee in 2012. And then they were adopted and went national 2013. So you can see that in California, the standards have been around for a long time. So there's a little bit of background on the standards. I have a little bit more to, to share with you, but then we're gonna get into the standards themselves to help you understand a little bit about what you would be getting into if you decided to take a training on the standards. We're gonna talk about being able to implement them at the program level and at the systems level. Then you'll have a chance to ask some questions. And I'm thinking that if you have questions now, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll try to get to those. Well, we will get to them towards the end, but we'll see what kinds of questions are coming up. So who is our focus on the standards? Our focus is on families who are responsible for raising children. Now it's important that that is a very broad definition because we know that families can consist or look very different, but we know that they consist of at least one adult and one, a chi and one child who are, could be related in several ways. That could be biologically, emotionally, or even legally. Families can consist of one parent or two parents. And you know that there are families that are made up of other caregivers like grandparents, foster parents, legal guardians. Some families arise um, out of the need for mutual support. And some of you may have been members of those kinds of families as defined. You may be part of that kind of a family now. 
I know that throughout my life, my family has expanded in many ways that covers several of these definitions. So we know that the definition needs to be broad. Again, here's that timeline I mentioned, but I wanna point out 2020. That's the year that the National Family Support Network engaged a national effort. Now notice it was significant because it included a number of parent leaders. It also included the Canadian Family Support Organizations because Canada is very interested in being part of this effort. Also, it included the Center for the Study of Social Policy to review and revise the standards with a focus, and this is important, on diversity, equity, and inclusion that would be relevant for both the United States and Canada. That was a huge undertaking. It was completed, and in 2021, the newest version of the standards was approved by the National Family Support Network. Now, that's important to us as Californians because we set the framework initially for the standards. But these have gone national now, and they have so many exciting things placed in them because of the outside efforts and the view of looking at it nationally. So what is the importance of the standards? The standards help ensure that families are supported and strengthened through quality practice. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to imply that those of you working with families are not doing quality practice. I'm sure that you are. But I know one of the things we don't do well is we don't always have a common language, especially across different kinds of family strengthening programs, such as home visiting programs, early care education programs, um, programs that work with families in schools. And I would even say programs that work with families in, in situations of domestic violence. We don't have a good common language all the time and we don't have similar expectations. We have them, but we don't talk about them that way. So the standards are designed to be used by all stakeholders, public departments, foundations, community-based organizations, and particularly by families. You're gonna see that as we go through this, families play an important, important role in helping us use the standards as a tool for planning, providing, and really determining if we're doing a good job with quality. The standards are, and their implementation tools are free. They're available to download at the National Family Support Network website. I would encourage you to go there after this webinar and download them and take a look at them, access them, and, and begin to look at them in relationship to your own program after I give you some instructions or some um, guidance, if you will, about how the standards actually are implemented. So now we have a little bit of an activity for you to do. On this slide, if you go to the top of your um, page or the top of your slide where you have some, or maybe it's at the bottom, I'm never sure on who's Zoom. And if you look at view options, if you go to view options, you should see something that says annotate. If you can find annotate, choose a stamp and go ahead and place a stamp on this slide within the box that you think best represents who you are today in this webinar. Great. I see people are finding it. Great. Go ahead and give you a few minutes to put those stamps in there. Let's see what kinds of representation we have. Again, if you go to view options and look at annotate, you should be able to find the stamp under annotate and choose a stamp. So I'll give you a couple minutes to see if we have some more people who want to um, identify. Right now we have networks of family strengthening and support programs. And we have a star way over on the side. I'm not sure where that star goes. Debbie, it looks like um, our uh, attendees don't have the ability to annotate the slides. Oh, it's probably a I security don't. setting. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I understand. I understand. Yep. A couple of people do. <laughs> so I am seeing a few things in there. I think I may even see one that's hitting or close to hitting policymaker, but I'm not sure. But that's great. We'll just take a look at some of this and, uh, and see, where, see where some of this goes. All right. That's good to know though. 
So the reason for identifying like that is because normally if, if people are able to choose where they represent, it gives us a chance to emphasize that the standards require a commitment of support at all levels of program responsibility. If you're gonna implement the standards in your program, it can't just be at the direct level, direct staff, uh, direct service staff level. This is where staff don't have the capacity to maybe change the policies that would allow them to work in some of the ways that they see in the standards. Uh, particularly important, again, I'm gonna mention our parent leaders and families and how you're including them. But again, if there is not buy-in at the top where people have the capacity to make some of the changes, looking at the standards could be difficult. So I just wanna encourage you that if you look at the standards or if you look at a standards training, you think about coming in uh, teams. That's where things seem to work the best. So unique to the standards is that it, I, I love saying these words, it integrates and operationalizes, say that real fast, two frameworks of support for families. The first one is the principles of family support practice that was developed by Family Support America. Now that's interesting because Family Support America um, actually developed these standards in 1981. And so some of you may not be real aware of those standards. Uh, in fact, well, before we get there, I wanna just mention that the other framework is one that you may know better, the research-based evidence-informed family strengthening families, protective factors approach. When I say that, people generally get that right off the bat. So I think we have a poll now, don't we, Jen? We have a poll to launch to see how familiar people are with the principles of family support. Yes. Would you please indicate how familiar you are with that first framework I told you, the principles of family support practice? like we have almost everyone who has participated. Yeah, we're at about 70%. Great. So give it another second, and then we will go ahead and um, wrap that up. All right, let me go ahead and end the poll and share results. Okay. You know, this is generally the way this kind of looks. Many people are not actually familiar with the principles of family support practice, or somewhat familiar. We have only a few who, who actually one who is familiar with the principles of family support. And that doesn't really necessarily surprise us because the family support principles were developed a long time ago. They were developed, it, well, a long time ago, uh, back in 1981 by Family Support America. This uh, organization no longer exists, but the principles do. And as we go through them, you're probably going to see that it makes sense that they're already there in your work. This is something that we've been talking about for a long time. So look at principle number one, staff and families work together in relationships based on equality and respect. This may not seem revolutionary today because we sort of expect that we're going to work that way. But there was a time when the prevailing knowledge and wisdom was that staff were the experts. They had their knowledge, their education, and their experience, and their goal was, and sometimes you actually heard it spoken of like this, was to fix a family. But this principle challenged that. It challenged that notion and said that staff and families are equal. They come to the table together. Staff may have some knowledge and experience, but families are the most knowledgeable about their own families and what they need. Principle number two says that staff enhances families' capacity to support the growth and development of all family members, adults, youth, and children. Now, this principle is important because it, it recognizes that in our programs, we look at the entire family, not just the individual. And sometimes in our programs, that's the individual that's just in front of us. 
but they are part of a much larger component, that family. And we also know that if we don't engage other family members, we need to ask, why are they not a part of things? We also, we know that when multiple families are engaged, the outcomes for families are likely to be better. And you think about how this has evolved over the years with multiple generational families living in the same home and how programs either recognize that or don't recognize it. Principle number three says, families are resources <clears throat> to their own members, to other families, to programs, and to communities. Again, this recognizes the fact that staff do not have all the answers in doing the work to support families. Families have the capacity to do their own work. It becomes our job to connect them with other families, to programs and to communities, and to share those resources. We don't have to do it all, but we do have to know how to connect them. Principle number four is called the diversity principle. Um, it's because it has two, two important but equal parts. The first is about respecting and affirming the diversity that families bring to the table when they, when they talk with us. That could include many aspects of diversity. And in the standards training, we talk a lot about diversity, how to recognize that, and how to affirm that in families. But the second part of this principle affirms the fact that we need to be supportive of families in preparing them to connect with larger communities, the larger communities that they interact with day to day. This will support them to fully function in a multicultural society in, in which we all live. Principle number five says that programs are embedded in their communities and contribute to the community building process. Family support programs do not simply see themselves as social service providers, but as community builders. And the only way that can happen is if we work closely with families who actually become the leadership in their community and make the changes in the community building process. Principle number six says that programs advocate with families for services and systems that are fair, responsive, and accountable to the families they serve. Would you think for just a minute, you don't need to respond to this in the chat, but would you think for just a minute about all the major systems that families that you work with commonly interact with? Just think about that for a minute. That covers a lot of areas. Um, uh, we were doing this in a discussion the other day. And of course, the usual things were mentioned like, you know, courts, schools, a lot of the bigger systems. And one that somebody put out there that I had never really thought about was uh, the systems that involve in your family participating in sports. And so the question that we ask when you think about these systems, are they all fair, responsive, and accountable to the families that they serve? Are they? And if I were to ask you this and have you put it in the chat box, I know I would get a resounding no. I would get some who would say that some try, um, but often they are not. And so our job becomes helping families to advocate for those services to be fair and responsive to them. Principle number seven says, practitioners work with families to mobilize formal and informal resources to support family development. So there's a strong emphasis in the field about resources. In fact, if you look around, you'll find that the most common type of family support program is a family resource center with that right there in its name. The emphasis is on resources, but while no program can possibly support all a family's needs, it is our responsibility to know how to connect them. Principle number eight says that programs are flexible and continually responsive to emerging family and community issues. This concept of flexibility is very important in the family support field because a neighborhood that today might be comprised mostly of Latinx might tomorrow or in five years be Asian. I know I've seen that within my own San Diego communities where there's been an influx of people in need and seeing communities change. That means our programs need to be flexible and responsive. You probably have seen that even as families have had things like socioeconomic turndowns 
And then what, what all could we say about the pandemic? What flexibilities had to happen just because of that? Then we have principle number nine that says that the family support principles are modeled in all of our program activities. And that includes planning, administration, and governance. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that actually happens in your program. These, pre, pre, these um, principles were developed and they um, are an interesting way for us to think about how we measure up with the work that we do. The next framework that we're talking about is the Center for Study of Social Policies, Strengthening Families and Protective Factors Framework. And I think we do have a poll. We have a poll about this one. We'd like to know uh, how many of you are familiar with this framework. And we've got responses coming in, so we'll give that just another couple of seconds and then we'll go ahead and close that out. Just give it a sec. All right, let me go ahead and end the poll. We'll share the results. Okay, we have somewhat familiar. That seems to be the majority of you, 44%. Not familiar, 33% of you are not familiar. That's interesting because um, that is not what we usually see. We see a lot of people familiar, but that's okay because it's important that we know where things are. And as I move through this discussion, you may want to know more about the uh, five protective factors yourself. So let's go on to this next part. So here are the actual five protective factors, parental resilience, social connections, concrete support in times of need, knowledge of parenting and child development, social and emotional competence of children. And notice there is a link at the bottom that you can go to for more information specifically about these five protective factors. What is unique about implementing these in a community is that when we do, we see the incidence of child abuse and neglect go down. We see those incidents significantly reduced by implementing these five protective factors. But how we do that is another discussion. So now let's get to some of the areas about how we can do that with both of the frameworks we just talked about. So the standards take both of the frameworks. They are in five sections, what we call standards. Here are those five standards. Family centeredness, family strengthening, diversity, equity, and inclusion, community strengthening, and a significant part of one is evaluation. So these two frameworks have been taken and woven into what we call standards of practice. So when we break these standards down to actual doable things to look at our programs, to measure our programs by, they actually come out to be 15 standards. Each standard has an indicator, a set of indicators that talk about being foundational, foundational quality or high quality. Those are terms you're gonna really get used to hearing. Foundational quality demonstrates that you have the basic application of the standard. And that's great because foundational quality is quality. Programs that want to build on foundational quality indicators do other things to achieve high quality. And that represents a deep, deeper integration of the standard. And so let's take a look at how we can do that. Here's the structure of the standards. Each indicator that I mentioned has a couple of examples that from the field that demonstrate how it could be applied. Those examples are not exhaustive, but they do come directly from the field. They come directly from people implementing these standards. As programs apply the standards, they are encouraged, you are encouraged to identify your own examples that demonstrate the indicators in the way that they are relevant for your community and your work. So again, this is not taking your program and altering it. It is taking your program and matching it up to some standards to see how it measures up. 
So here are the foundational quality indicators. They create a family strengthening and support foundation. The good thing about them is that they can usually be met within the reasonable scope that a family resource center has. Sometimes as you move to high quality indicators, first you must have foundational. Programs are encouraged to strive to meet them, but it also may require that you look at some capacity building. But this thing we do know, implementing the standards is a developmental process. And it's very possible that you may see aspects of your program at different levels on this continuum. So notice there's an arrow at the bottom with a continuum that talks about foundational quality, maybe not yet addressed. Maybe it's, it's an idea at this point, but it hasn't really even been addressed. And then it moves across the continuum as you implement different action items to where you meet foundational quality and meet high quality. But notice that the arrow continues. <laughs> and that's because we know there's always room for growth. That's why it's called high quality and not maximum quality, because we don't think you hit maximum. So how do you move from foundational to high quality? At the top, you see the four standards that use this particular arrow. On the left, you see foundational quality with its indicators. On the right, you see high quality indicators. Moving to deeper integration of the standard would be by implementing the, imp the elements in the arrow. And that would be formal structure. Formal structure could look like designs, policies, procedures, intentional strategies with committed resources. This would help ensure a consistency in your practice. Then there's staff training. And this is a particular kind of training. This is training on the standards themselves and how your staff model them and work within them. And the last one is family partnership. How are you partnering with families as you implement the standards? And this is one that I find as programs, we talk a lot about, we worry a lot about, and sometimes we do some things well, and we get kind of stuck there. So the good thing about foundational is that it is setting a standard. But what can we put into place so that that foundational quality thing that we did isn't something that just happens one time? That it's actually in place so that it would take place on a consistent basis. If there was a sudden change in leadership or certain people uh, left the program for whatever reasons or the program expanded, how could you ensure that what you put in place stayed there? So let's see how this actually works. Here's the first standard, family centeredness, right there at the top. Here's an aspect of that standard. It says the program engages families to participate in program development and implementation. So on the left, you see the foundational quality indicator that says, here's a way you do that. The program solicits input from families to shape and plan the program and services. That's foundational. Many of you probably even do that. So how can we do deeper integration and move to high quality? Notice on the right, the high quality indicator says that your program designs supports that partner with families to have an active role in the development and implementation of the program. How do you get there? You look at the elements in the arrow. The elements in the arrow say formal structure and family partnership. Now with each of these standards and indicators, there are elements in the arrow. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. But in order to move to high quality, you have to have all of the elements in the arrow. So as you looked at your program, we would give you some suggestions and ideas about how to look at a formal structure. What could a family partnership look like? Um, many organizations have things like parent advisory councils, where they actually have a formal process where they solicit information from their parents on a regular basis to know um, how to implement things in their program. This arrow has to do with uh, the last standard, which is a little bit different because it's evaluation. Nevertheless, it's a very important one. We see evaluation as key to what we do in our programs because 
we know we do good work, but we're not always really good about how we talk about it or how we demonstrate it. So the evaluation has its own arrow. You see that it has foundational quality on the left. It has high quality on the right for deeper integration, but how you get there is different. You collect information, of course, we all do all the time, but do we analyze that information? Not only do we analyze the information, do we share evaluation results? Sometimes that gets a little tricky about how you share it, who you share it with. And then the last part, which is really significant, is that we look at what we've collected and we modify our program where we recognize that things need to change. So that's an important part. We modify our programs. Now you are not without implementation tools because the standards training particularly offers these implement implementation tools. The first one is called the program self-assessment tool. Now it's designed to be used by programs who have already been trained on the standards. So don't, don't try to do it without some knowledge of the standards. It will be completely frustrating to you. But if you've been trained on the standards, it is designed to take that same team, including managers, direct staff, parent leaders, and it's actually a critical thinking exercise that takes you through your program to look at how you measure yourself along the continuum of standards. Next, there's the staff self-reflection checklist. This is an 18 question list for staff to use as a daily reminder about how to implement the standards. Most staff put it up right in front of them where they can see it on a regular basis and actually do some reflection about how they are implementing the standards. Personally, I find the staff self-reflection checklist as a great tool to use in supervising staff because it gives a really good opportunity for self-reflection about their work. And I find that it is seen in a very positive light when you go through that with, with your staff. Um, the last one I'm gonna mention is the standards participant survey. These are 18 questions for program participants to tell you exactly what we try to get information about all the time. How good is your program? It's not a typical satisfaction survey and the questions mirror the staff self-reflection checklist. So if your staff are working in a way that reflects on the standards, it's going to be very easily seen when you do the participant survey. All of these, assess all of these implementation tools are available on the National Family Support Network website. You can go there today and download them and look at them and use them. Although I do suggest you don't try to use that program self-assessment tool yet. So we see training as a fundamental strategy for implementing the strategies effectively, I mean, standards effectively. I think I've told you that a couple of times. So the standards are offered as a certification training. Now this says in person, but nothing's in person right now with the standards. It's all virtual, which does make some parts of it easier to do. However, in the virtual training, it is a day and a half training, not um, a single day. But it's designed, as we mentioned before, for all, all levels of staff, including funders. And we encourage funders to participate in this so that they can see what aspects of uh, measurement for work within programs could actually be funded. We see this as highly uh, effective in helping funders work in partnership with programs. The participants who uh, get the standard training receive a certificate that's valid for two years. Now, it's important to note that the certification is for the individual, not, not the organization. So as staff sometimes do move from program to program, that's a certification that they take with them. Then last of all, we do have a Trainer of, Trainer, Trainer of Trainers Institute. This is a four-day in-person, when well, it's in-person, but a five-day virtual training. So right now it's the five-day virtual training for representatives of the National Family Support Network to be able to conduct your own certification trainings. 
So after you've taken the standards training, if in fact you want to talk with us about, well, how would I become a trainer so that I could sustain some of this within my own network and my own programs? We can definitely talk to you about how that can happen. The goal here is to um, increase our capacity in the state of California. We recognize that we have a need to do that. Here's what training looks like right now across the nation. So you can see which states have trainers at this point and trainers only train within their states. So uh, you see that some states are, you know, are just now getting started. They only have a few, few trainers and they're working very hard to establish more trainers. The good thing about uh, the evaluations that we get back about the standards training is that overall people find it, they're very satisfied with the, um, with the information that they get and that they feel ready to implement the standards. To me, that's really important that when you take the standards training, when you're done, you actually feel like you're ready to go. You actually feel like you have something in front of you to do. So post-certification training has shown that 91% of the respondents said that it, is, it has enhanced their work. And at least 85% report using more of the standards, using one or more of the standards implementation tools. And I always encourage people after they've taken the standards training to go back right away while it's fresh in their mind and do the program self-assessment. Here's a couple of statements. I'm just going to let you take a look at those. I don't need to read those for you about things people have said about standards training and how it helps with their organizational thoughts about how they do their work. Again, they're doing great work, but it's a great way to give us guidelines and action that help us talk about common themes in our works, in our work. So some great things about the standards, about the networks that are formed through the standard certification trainings is that those networks have strengthened the capacities of states in amazing ways. So for example, if we think about Arizona, Arizona is just kind of on fire with the standards. Um, they provide it as a common language for diverse programs across their state. And within, um, within a year or so, they grew their alliance that originally had 21 member agencies to 72 agencies. And that was significant because that increased the common language across their state. So to ensure the accessibility and the affordability of the standards, the certification trainings are invested back into supporting networks. And that way networks can look at how they can keep this affordable to be able to train within their networking, train their staff. The National Family Support Network sets a criteria or a guideline for charging for the standards trainings. Those can range anywhere from no cost, if a network has funds to support that, all the way up to charging $150 per participant. Now, remember that that comes with a manual and a certification certificate. Here's something that we call the program implementation. Take a quick look at this. This illustrates a way that you could take your program at a glance and see where you are on the continuum of, of implementing it into your program. There's some steps above. Along the side are some sample activities, the resources that you would need in order to do that, and if there's a cost associated with it. So today we're more at the first step for many of you where you may just be preparing to take a look at the standards to see if it's something you wanna look at. If we were in a training today, I would be pointing out that you were already at the third step because you had begun using this, uh, begun training on the standards of family support practice. This continuum is available for download on the National Family Support Network website. So you can get this, you can print it out and you can use it as you, as you talk about your own programs. So now I wanna give you a personal experience that I've had in using the standards. I mentioned that I had worked as a uh, director of a family resource center in San Diego. Now that came about because there was a community there who looked around and decided that the services that families were getting 
were kind of all over the place. And the families didn't really know who to turn to to get the services that they need. So what this group wanted was something called that they called a coordinated case management between multiple family service agencies. So their idea and interest was to bring agencies who were already in practice and bringing them together in a coordinated case management way. And that would be across multiple agencies. That was their goal. They felt like that if they took agencies and put them under one roof, that maybe this would promote some of the practice. Well, it, it did a little bit. However, the challenge was that now you had multiple, multiple agencies under one roof, but they were all still kind of working within a silo. They were all kind of doing business as usual, which is not a bad thing. That's, that's what we're all trained to do. So they decided to train all of the agencies on the standards and train it under the organizational structure of the Family Resource Center. Now you see who it was completed by. All of the individuals that were there from multiple agencies were trained on the standards. What you see in front of you is an image of what um, a program self-assessment summary looks like. Because after you complete the assessment tool, it does a nice printout for you of your summary of where your program says it is. So you can see in this case, there was some feeling that working on family centeredness was meeting minimum quality. And then as they worked through family centeredness, they actually found that in terms of being welcoming to families, they thought they met high quality and that's great. But they also knew that there were some areas that they wanted to work on um, as far as implementing family centeredness, which was just one of the standards. They definitely came out of there or we came out of there with action items. And the action items centered on maybe having a um, centralized intake. Uh, one of the ideas was that maybe we had a similar consent form that we used to make it easier to talk with each other about how we support families. And then the important part was the development of a coordinated case management meeting. So those are the things that came out of being trained on the standards, doing the program assessment tool, and developing some action plans. Here's an example of what a family resource center did, a network of family resource centers did in Santa Barbara. They trained on the standards. They also looked at it with alignment with other frameworks. And they discovered that in using the common language across the field, they could be more accountable to funders. And that funders were much more interested in funding some of the things that they had in common than trying to diversify it across lots of pots of money. And then they also looked at it and implementing it within their network. So there is a network implementation. I'm gonna show you that next. But the good thing about the network was it helped give them tools on how to actually do these things. They developed training schedules for their family resource centers. Then their family resource centers were accountable and working towards implementation. Here's what the network implementation continuum looks like. So you see that it looks similar, steps across the top, sample activities and resources. And this is for your network to look at as far as tools that it may need. If it's thinking, how would we put the standards within all of the programs in the networks that we're working with? Here's an example of what New York did. New York went about getting membership commitment to their network. They offered the training and the certification. Those who took it to the program self-assessment tools, developed actions, actions for implementation. But then what the network did for them was they realized that these programs needed technical assistance. So they worked on providing the technical assistance for the, net, for the programs in the network. Here's a really, really, really um, wide one. This one really uh, spreads out here. This is San Francisco's. San Francisco took a three-prong approach in their network and how to implement the standards. They used training and assessment and important for them was the membership. So they trained people on the standards. They encouraged them to use the program self-assessment tool. They also made being trained on the standards a criteria for membership in their network. Some networks uh, do that. 
And this last one I think is particularly interesting. This is Colorado's um, because they've been very uh, successful in the standards. What they did is they took the standards of quality uh, training and anyone in their organization was trained on the standards, anyone. It didn't matter whether they were the people at the front desk. It didn't matter if they were the people who came in to clean the offices. Everyone got trained on the standards of quality support and practice. Afterwards, they took those who actually worked directly with families, direct line staff and their uh, supervisors, and gave them a little more direct training on the five protective factors. And then last of all, well, that one on strengthening families, five protective factors, that one is offered in many ways. I know that Caltrain has offered it. Um, I know that they've offered at least once that I'm aware of, but it is a 14 hour online free training online um, with the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. If that's something that you wanna do, uh, sometimes that's a difficult one because it is so long, but I would strongly encourage you to take a look at other training aspects with the five protective factors, especially if you're not real familiar with it. And then staff working directly with families in case management roles were required to complete their 60 hour family development credential. Uh, so the, this network in particular got very aggressive with how they implemented the supports in this tiered support pro, uh, process. So again, why adopt the standards? It will deepen your practice. It will establish common language. Really important is that it develops partnership opportunities, especially as you begin to talk about in common language, the things you know families need. It will give you a shared measurement system by which to measure your work. That's especially important in the state of California as we look at, do we have common ways of measuring work that we can speak to policymakers about? It will give you something concrete to do to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And many programs are looking for that support right now, more so than ever, because it's something we recognize we need to talk about. And then also it gives you the chance to be part of a national movement with the National Family Support um, Network. So again, you can download the standards and review them, possibly download the continuum, the program uh, continuum and take a look and see what that looks like. You can check the certification training page on the National Family Support website to see if your state has a network that's currently offering a standard certification training. If it is, you'll have a contact person that you can reach out to to ask what happens next in order to register for that training. So in California, we have access to these trainings through Caltrain, through CIFRA, and through your local network. So those are three areas you can check after you check on the National Family Support Network if there are no trainings listed there. Because we know that in California right now, we have several in the process of uh, being uh, put together so that they can be offered in the state. Okay, now we are at a point of questions and answers. Are there a number of questions we should probably uh, take a look at? Dana, I'm kind of really, Dana and, and Jennifer, I'm kind of relying on you to see if there's some things we should be answering or maybe you should answer. Yeah, I think if, if people have questions, please go ahead, enter into the chat. Um, and what we might want to do is, uh, Debbie, if you want to go through the next couple slides while Great. folks are putting any questions they have into the chat, uh, we can again kind of pause at the end and answer anything that's come up. This might even answer some of their questions if we go through the next slides. So I wanna call your attention to a couple of supports you have. One of them is the National Family Support Network webinar Wednesdays. These are free. You just go on the um, website and register for them. Um, you see the ones coming up in September. They're mostly uh, what you see in these webinars is how different networks and programs have implemented support within their own state and how their state is aligned. So it's fascinating to see how states are doing this work and it gives us great ideas for what we can do in California. The one on September 29th, I think is uh, a little bit unique because it's about supporting grand families and kinship navigation. 
And then once a month on the National Family Support Network website, there's always an overview of the standards, pretty similar to what I did for you today, though the one I did for you today was a little heavier emphasis on California and California's role. There is a standard certification training coming up on October 19th and 20th. It is a virtual one and it will cover mountain and Pacific times. You can register for that training at the National Family Support Network.org. There is a fee for this training because it is being hosted by the National Family Support Network. And whenever they offer it, there is a fee associated with it. If you want to sign up for standard certification training, um, if you want to look at where there are some, sign up for the Caltrain email uh, in that newsletter because in there it will tell you when the next trainings are. Notice <laughs> those ones do not have a fee. Those are free standard certification trainings that are being offered. You can also check with your local network to see if they are sponsoring the training. Was there anything more you want to say about that one, Jen, that we will cover? Yeah, I think we'll hope to be releasing a date for November, December yes. pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that. There is a training available through the National Family Support Network about how to develop and sustain effective parent advisory committees. Throughout the standards, there's going to be lots of opportunity to look at your program and its capacity for how it engages parents on multiple levels. A parent advisory committee is a fabulous way to do some of that work and use your parent leadership. So it's a highly rated virtual training and it is for program staff so that they learn how to maximize potential of parent advisory committees. Um, it is co-trained by someone from the national network and an experienced national parent leader, which only makes sense if you're doing a, a training on parent advisory. But that is available too. If you go to the network uh, website, you can see when those are offered and see how you might sign up for that. In California, you have a couple of contacts for, um, for looking at standards training. Um, through the California Family Resource Association. Um, I'm happy to be a support for that contact and can help you in navigating where there are standards trainings available. You can also go to the CIFRA uh, website, as Jen mentioned, and see when there are, um, uh, Jen mentioned the Caltrans, sorry. You can go to the CIFRA website and see when there are standards trainings that are being offered. And then of course there's Caltrans if you go to their website sign up for their newsletter, you can find out when the next free standard certification trainings are being offered. We would encourage you to join the statewide network of CIFRA. There are member benefits to doing that. It gives us a shared voice in Sacramento, which is especially important with all the voices that are there. It gives us connection to FRCs and networks around the state. Um, CIFRA is usually in the loop of when there are multiple funding streams coming out available for your networks and for your programs. This is a great way to stay connected with this. You will also get regular updates on the family strengthening, strengthening field, both at the state level and federal level, because CIFRA is our state network connected with the National Family Support Network. Okay, here's some upcoming trainings. I don't, you can do this, Jen or Dana, one of the two of you. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead and just talk briefly about them. And Dana, um, if you are able to, you can drop those uh, registration links in the chat box again. So this is just a handful of trainings that we have uh, coming up. We'll be doing uh, nurturing parent, uh, child and parent development with uh, Dr. Pradeep Gidwani uh, in October. We have trauma parenting and challenging behaviors focusing on school age in the end of October. We are gonna have one on adolescence, uh, focus on adolescent behaviors. Uh, that'll be, I think in, ah, I can't remember, later in the year. Uh, we <laughs> have spreading, December, thank you, thank you, Dana. We have um, spreading hope, which is uh, basically a movement that's coming out of the ACEs mm -hmm. uh, uh, movement, but this is focusing on kind of positive experiences and the, po and the experiences uh, and how those are impacting uh, impacting everyone. And Dana, I think you are sending those links just to me. So oh, you you're right. Wanna, yes. Well, thanks. Switch those up, over to everyone. 
And then lastly, uh, in November, we have one called Feedback That Works. And this is one that's targeted at uh, leaders, so supervisors and leaders about how to give feedback to staff mm -hmm. in a more effective uh, in a more effective way. Um, so you can visit caltern.org uh, for the full training calendar and uh, sign up for yeah many more that are coming. We're going to have some on um, uh, working with different tribal communities. We have um, more DEI specific ones coming. We have LGBTQ focused training. So lots of different things that are coming up in the next few months. So keep an eye on those. And I have not seen any questions come through while we've been okay. talking. Let me just scroll through. So if there's any last minute questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Otherwise, we'll let Debbie do a, a, a final word and we'll wrap up for the day. Um, one of the things I appreciate about knowing about uh, other trainings throughout the state is that when we train on the standards, we know that we touch on areas, but that it takes deeper integration of knowledge to really move things the way you want to in your program. So when you have a chance, take a look at some of the links we've given you with CIFRA and with Caltrain um, to look at additional training that you may want to participate in. So now that brings us to the last part here, our next steps and evaluation. I'm hoping that during the training you've actually had, or the webinar, you've had a chance to maybe write down some ideas that you have for your own next steps and things that you may want to look at or get some more information about. Uh, we do have an evaluation survey that we, that's going to automatically pop up. And we would ask you to please answer these questions, uh, identifying your next steps and how we could best support you with those. And then also, um, we look forward to offering this overview a couple more times. So if you have anybody that you think should be seeing this in overview, let us know, and we can do more of. All right, I think basically that's, that's it. That's great. Hey. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And again, keep an eye on Caltrain. Uh, we'll be offering free standard certification training. So if you want to move forward with the standards process, we can support that. Uh, for those of you who are outside of California, you want to check that uh, National Family Support website and see who your trainers are, your networks, and how to be trained uh, in your area. So thank you all again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.